So having considered uh, both the RC circuit and the LC, LR circuit, uh, now we're going to put all three together into a what's called a series RLC circuit. We could also have a parallel RLC circuit, but we're not going to actually consider that. Now, uh, the mathematics here uh, becomes somewhat involved. It's not any more difficult than what we've done before, but it becomes more involved, and we'll see a, a more straightforward way to do it later, but we should be able to do, at least this case, to reinforce our uh, circuit analysis uh, uh, techniques. So we begin, uh, we're going to analyze the voltage going around the circuit using KVL, mesh method with one loop, and so we go up through V, we uh, lose voltage through R, we lose voltage through C, and we lose voltage through L, which I've listed as these three terms here. I haven't substituted them in yet. And then in each case, I plug in the IV characteristic. So for the resistor, of course, it's just Ohm's law. The voltage across the capacitor is just uh, the integral of the current. So I plug that in here, divided by C. And the voltage across the inductor is just the derivative of the current times L. Now, since this equation has both inter uh, integrals and derivatives, I just want to take the derivative of the whole equation, each term, and get that equation. So I have dv dt here, uh, r di dt, because I take the derivative of i. Uh, the derivative of the integral of i is just i, and then the integral, the derivative of i with respect to t becomes the second derivative. And now, because I have a second derivative, I have a second order differential equation and so rearranging all those terms, bringing the i terms on the other side, I see that I have i double prime dividing out the L uh, plus r over L uh, times i prime, that's this term divided by L, and then uh, i over LC, that's this term divided by L, and finally dv dt, uh, which I see should have a 1 over L in it. Uh, because there's a 1 over L everywhere. Okay, so now all I have to do is solve that equation. Uh, and, but first, let's consider the case where the resistance is zero and there's no, uh, there's no voltage source. So this is gone and this is gone. I just have an LC circuit. My uh, equation becomes this. And if you, we look at that equation, we see that a cosine will solve that because uh, the second derivative of a cosine is the cosine with a, a minus sign. And so if we take the second derivative of this particular function, we get a omega squared minus cosine, well, sorry, minus a omega squared cosine omega t plus phi. And so I can solve this equation as long as omega squared that comes out from that second derivative equals the factor in front of my i term. Uh, 1 over LC, and so I see that uh, I'm going to get a characteristic sloshing back and forth between the inductor and the capacitor with a frequency which is the square root of 1 over LC. Now we'll go on to consider uh, the homogeneous case with the resistor, uh, so V is still 0, and so then I have this equation. And to make uh, life a little bit easier, I'm going to replace my coefficients uh, as such. So I already know that LC, 1 over LC should be something like omega squared, and I'm then looking backwards from the end, I'm going to want to replace this with a constant 2 alpha. So 2 alpha equals R over L. That just makes my life easy. And I'm going to guess a solution. With all linear differential equations, if you can guess the right solution and show that it works, then you have the solution. So I'm going to guess the solution uh, of a form E uh, to the ST. S is some factor that I need to figure out. A is just a constant. And so I go and I calculate each of the derivatives. When I take the first derivative, I bring down one factor of S. When I take the second derivative, I bring down another factor of S. Uh, notice that when I bring down an S here, I still have I left behind. So I prime is just S times I. And likewise, i double prime is just s squared times i. And I can plug those into this equation, and what I get is s squared plus 2 alpha s plus omega squared. And each one of those terms had an i, but because I have a homogeneous 
equation, since there's a zero over here, I can divide out the i, since it's common to everything. And now I have what's known as the secular equation for, for this uh, differential equation. And note that that is an algebraic equation. All I have to do is solve for s, and it's a quadratic equation, so I just write, use the quadratic formula to write down the solution. So clearly, the solution is going to depend on whether the discriminant is positive or negative, um, or zero. And so that depends on whether alpha squared is less than omega squared, alpha squared equals omega squared, or alpha squared is, is greater than omega squared. Now, if alpha squared is less than omega squared, I have the square root of a negative number, in which case s, as a variable, is a complex number. Uh, and in fact, we saw that already, if omega is, if s is purely imaginary, so there's no alpha at all, uh, then, um, oh, I see a mistake here. This, sorry, this is a minus sign. Otherwise, I wouldn't get a negative number. Uh, so if if omega, uh, if alpha is zero because the resistance is gone, uh, we have a e to the minus omega t, uh, i omega t, and that by Euler's formula is just a cosine plus a sine, and we saw that already. So in these solutions we have, uh, if we have an imaginary voltage or an imaginary current, how do we understand that? What we do is we go through the whole cal uh, calculation and we just take the real part at the end, and so in this case we just take the cosine part and ignore the sine part. So let's go through the whole solution in the case where alpha squared is less than omega squared, which means we have a small value of r. Uh, so uh, first of all, we, uh, we, we start with our uh, secular equation. We write down the solution from the quadratic equation, and then we're going to replace uh, alpha squared minus omega squared square root with omega prime. Uh, notice it's slightly different than omega. Uh, it's a, omega prime is a real number, uh, which is a square root of omega squared minus alpha squared in this case. Uh, so now we, uh, we want to find the current, and we know the solutions, right? So since we have a plus or minus, we have to include both solutions to be as general as possible. And so uh, we have both written down. S1 will be plus, S2 will be minus, or the other way around. It doesn't matter. Uh, notice that both of those terms have the same alpha part, so we can factor that out. We have an exponential of, of to the power of two terms. We factor out the e to the minus alpha t. That's a pure real exponential. And then we have the imaginary part left over. And so we can factor that part, we can factor that real exponential out, and we're left with this. Now, a combination of two exponentials, imaginary exponentials, with opposite signs allows us to recombine uh, those two terms in terms of a sine and a cosine, which I show here. And so in the end, we end up with an exponential decay, and the combination of our two, these both a and b are complex numbers, so the sum of them times the cosine of omega prime t minus j times the difference of those times sine omega t. And so we have two initial conditions. Often it'll be something like the current at t equals zero and the variation, the rate of change of the current at t equals zero. And that'll allow us to determine uh, a plus b and a minus b. So I show that here. Um, I write down that's the same equation. I set i equals zero, uh, i zero here to find the current, uh, and uh, so I just plug t equals zero into the equation. And if if I have, then I'll have zero as part of the cosine, which gives one. Zero as part of the sine, which gives zero. And so I just select that first term, a plus b. So I know that a plus b is going to be the current at t equals zero. And then I plug in i prime, I take the derivative of my solution, uh, and I, I go through all, all the calculation, and uh, then I plug in t equals zero again, uh, which will select out uh, now this term and uh, this initial term. And so uh, I, I 
well, since I've already determined what a plus b is, this condition determines what a minus b is. Finally, let's consider the case where we have a, an actual driving voltage. So we have the, the non-homogeneous case that we'll get. Uh, and so, well, let's just go through it. So we do KVL as we did before. Uh, we get the answer. Uh, we get the equation is written. And uh, we, we go through the analysis and uh, we get the equation, but now we have this V prime, uh, which has an L in it, um, and we need to uh, to solve uh, for that. Now, we're going to neglect the homogeneous uh, solutions in this case. Uh, homogeneous solutions give rise to what's called transients, and we're going to neglect the transients. In this case, we're only uh, interested in the the uh, it's not the steady state solution, but the solution long after any changes happen. Uh, so, as with always with a particular solution, we're going to assume the force the response has the same form as the uh, forcing function. In this case, we're putting going to put in a sinusoidal. Oops, uh, didn't mean to circle it, but that's fine. Uh, sinusoidal function of the voltage, and so we expect the output to also be sinusoidal. The voltage. Uh, across anything between any two points will be sinusoidal and the current everywhere will be sinusoidal but in particular it will have the same frequency of response as the input. Uh, so um, so we start uh, we're going to assume that the current has uh, has this form right where this omega matches the omega we put in and then we just calculate the uh, the current, the rate of change of the current, and the second derivative, and plug those in. And so uh, we get we just plug these into the the equation here, and uh, we go through the analysis. Uh, we we have a b e to the j omega t in each term, well we, we have an a, but so we can get rid of all the exponentials and we're just left with an, an algebraic expression for uh, b with respect to the a that we put in and the omega and uh, we can factor out b from everything on the left hand side and so we have this and then we want to find in the end, we want to find what's the ratio of, of b to a, and that's the gain. Uh, the amplitude out is b, the amplitude in is a, so when we do the calculation, uh, we're going to have j omega divided by this term, um, and notice that I have omega naught squared minus omega squared. Omega naught is the, would be the, what we would expect if there was no forcing, just with the l and the c. And omega, not, omega is what we're putting in, uh, and so uh, we want to keep those two together. They have the same functional form. Now, in this expression, we have imaginary terms on top and bottom, and so we want to multiply top and bottom by the bottom, uh, the complex conjugate of the bottom, uh, to, to get an easy-to-understand expression. So we multiply j omega by the complex conjugate as we change the sign of, of j over here. So when we do that, we get this term squared plus this term squared. We'll end up with a j times minus j, and the cross terms will go away because they'll have opposite signs. So we just take the sum of the two bottom terms squared, and then we work out the top, and we see that we have uh, 2a omega squared plus j omega times omega minus omega naught squared minus omega squared. Uh, now, the interesting part of this is that uh, this can become very large if omega uh, goes to omega naught, and that's what we know as resonance. So, uh, we, can, we can also re-express it this way. This is a magnitude and a phase, uh, and we see that the, mag the magnitude, the amplitude, uh, goes 
we, if this term goes away and this term is very small, B over A be, can become quite large in magnitude.